Okay, well, um, thank you, Sandra, so, you know, for inviting me to, you know, give you guys this little training on social security. Um, my name is Stephanie. I'm the client's rights advocate for North Los Angeles Regional Center Consumers. And, um, you know, today I wanted to talk to you guys about um, supplemental security income. Um, so supplemental security income, it's like the program that people with disabilities can enter into to get money, um, you know, if they're unable to work. And it's actually also the program that, you know, people get money from after they retire after the age of 65. So, you know, um, it's actually the same thing as, you know, like when you get really old and you retire, it's the same program. It just has like some different eligibility requirements for, you know, when you um, are applying for um, because of disability and not because, you, you know, you're age 65 and you retired. So um, today um, we're going to, you know, sort of review what kind of benefits that you can get from SSI and you know, how social security defines what a disability is um, and what substantial gainful activity is, that's something that's gonna be really important for eligibility. Um, you know, how much money you can get, how to apply for these benefits, and then we're gonna talk about sort of the appeals process and um, after you, know, you, you enroll in SSI, your, your, you know, your child enrolls in SSI, what are some of the things that can happen afterward that um, you know, that if you have questions about, you know, you can come to our office. So we're going to kind of review sort of the whole process is in, is in, in an overview. And um, hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, if you do have questions during the presentation, you know, you can feel free to just type them in the chat and I'll try to answer them um, if I get a chance. Okay, so first, um, we need to know what disability means for social the Social Security Administration, because, you know, they have a their own definition for what disability means. So um, basically, Social Security thinks that you are disabled if you don't have the ability to engage in substantial gainful activity because of a medically determinable ailment, which is either going to you know, last until you die or last for more than a year um, or 12 months. They say 12 months, but you know, that's a year. So um, it's kind of very specific, but you know, if, if you have a medical diagnosis and you know, it, it's you know, permanent and like Down syndrome, for example, is and, um, you know, it does substantially affect your ability to like sort of engage in work. You know, you know, you might be eligible for social a supplemental security income. And so, um, yeah, the, the impairment has to be severe, it has to basically prevent you from being able to work um, or to do other important life activities. Um, so, what is substantial gainful activity? So basically, if you make over um, a certain amount of money every month, Social Security thinks that your disability isn't severe enough that you can't work. So um, right now, and I think this is number for, you know, for this year, if you are not blind, um, if you make more than $1,350 a month, um, you would not qualify for supplemental security income because Social Security thinks that uh, you, you're not disabled enough to not work because you're making that much money. That's sort of like the income limit per month for someone with a disability. If they want to apply for SSI, you have to make less than $13.50 a month. Um, if you're blind, the number is higher. It's $22.60. Um, but basically, there is an income limit for applying for or for qualifying for social supplemental security income. Um, children have a slightly different standard for what disability means um, for Social Security because um, it doesn't need to be sort of lifelong. It just needs to last for at least one year. Um, and you compare the child to sort of other children that their age um, and seeing like sort of where their developmental milestones are. Um, and, you know, when you are, if you're a parent applying for SSI on behalf of your kid, you're going to want to make sure that you have records like from the regional center or, you know, like diagnoses assessments from doctors and, you know, any IEPs or anything that sort of like indicate what kind of behavioral or, you know, functional limitations your child has to submit those to social security, because that's the only way that they're going to know sort of like how, um, you know, what, how your child is being affected. Um, so it's really important to sort of like when social security asks you for different documents to sort of just let, give it to them because otherwise they won't have complete information and, a lot of times when there's not complete information, they just deny the application because they aren't able to sort of properly assess um, the situation. Um, there's a specific list of what the disabilities are. Like, the, I guess there's like a list of qualifying disabilities for SSI. Um, 
I'm assuming, I guess, I, I don't know, just because, um, you know, I'm presenting here for the SALA that um, most of the people here are going to have Down syndromes, which would be a, um, a qualifying disability. Um, but I want to go through an example listing just to sort of show you guys what you would, you know, like thinking about when you want to show social security that you're disabled, what sort of evidence you want to bring. So basically for, um, for uh, proving like a disability, they're going to have in the listing like this, the, like the name of the disability here, and it's going to have these requirements inside of it. Um, and so, you know, here it says that you need medical documentation and one or both of the following. And so you see that it says like, you know, frequent distractibility, blah, 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 and hyperactive and impulsive behavior. You need to make sure that you have some kind of document or evidence that shows that you either, you know, are frequently distractible and like you can't make, pay attention or that you have hyperactive and impulsive behavior. So you want to make sure that for each of the you know, traits that's sort of listed under the disability that are required, you have some kind of evidence that indicates that that applies to you, because that's how they determine if you have a qualifying disability, is if you, you know, match up to the, like, sort of the, the traits that they put under the disability. Um, so, you know, um, I showed in this, this link right here, ssa.gov slash disability slash professional slash blue book, that is the official SSA listing where it shows all of the disabilities and lists sort of the traits that um, are required to sort of like qualify under that disability. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, you know, if you're applying for the first time, um, if you wanna make it as smooth as possible, you know, I really highly recommend looking at that listing or, you know, if you're not sure how to do it, you call our office and we can help you go through it to make sure you sort of have all the evidence that you need um, to, you know, make your case as strong as possible. Um, Okay, so supplemental security income, it's a program that's for people who demonstrate financial need. There's an income and also a resource limit. Um, so I'm, I'll explain what that exactly means in a little bit. Um, and basically to be eligible, you need a disability that prevents you from engaging in substantial gainful activity, which as we talked about before, means that your disability has to make it so you can't hold a job that makes more than $13.50 a month. Um, and then, you know, alternatively, you have to be a low income individual that is over the age of 65, but that's not sort of relevant to the disability discussion. Um, you can apply for SSI, you know, at your local SSA office or online. You, I think you can also apply over the phone. Um, and if you, obtain, you know, if you start receiving SSI, you automatically get Medi-Cal, um, which means that, you know, if you get SSI, you have Medi-Cal, which means you're also eligible for in-home supportive services, um, you know, which is a service where you can like get um, money to pay someone to come do things like cleaning your house and things like that if you have, if you struggle with that because of your disability. So it's actually really useful um, if, you know, if you qualify for SSI to apply for it and sort of try to get, um, get into the program because it comes with a lot of other things as well. Okay, so, um, as I said before, it's a need-based program. So you need to have, you know, the income limit is $13.50 a month. If you make more than that, you're not going to qualify. And then there's also a resource limit. So resources are different than income. Income is just the money you made that specific month. Resources are sort of like, you can think about it as all the money in your bank account from before that, like from before, you know, before you got your paycheck, all the money that was already in your bank account, SSA thinks that that calls that a resource. Mm -hmm. um, resources don't have to be money. They can also be things like a house or a car, um, other things like that. Um, but um, there are some exceptions for the resources that are counted against you. So for instance, um, you're allowed to own one car and one house and those don't count as resources towards like the resource limit. Um, so the resource limit is actually pretty low. Um, it's $2,000 for if you're an individual, like a single person, and it's $3,000 if you're a couple. So if you have more than $2,000 in resources, um, you actually aren't going to be eligible for SSI. And we're going to talk a little bit later about how to, you know, make sure you can stay under the resource limit. Um, but that's sort of an important thing to think about is just making sure, you know, that, uh, you know, after you start collecting SSI to make sure that you stay below the resource limit because, that can affect your eligibility. Um, so um, if you're um, a child, the SSA 
considers part of parents' income and resources as a child's resources when they're determining eligibility. Um, there's like a really complicated formula for that. I didn't really want to go into it into this presentation, but you know, if you have specific questions, um, you can come to our office and we can talk about it in more detail. Um, if you are older than 18, Social Security should not be considering your parents' resources and income when they're assessing your eligibility. Even if you still live at home, um, you know, you're an adult, so they shouldn't be considering your parents' income. They only should do that if, you know, the person that is applying for SSI is a minor. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about, like, you know, what happens if you have too many resources, right? What if you have more than $2,000 in your bank account? So there's a couple things that you can do um, to make sure that you don't go over the resource limit. So one of the things that um, I think is really cool is it's called a Cal Able account. Um, it's uh, it's basically an account that a kind of account that was created by the government specifically because some people were having issues with resource limits. Whatever money you put into the Cal Able account is not going to count as a resource for Social Security purposes. Um, and you can use the money in there for disability related expenses. So that's going to be things like, you know, travel expenses to go to the doctor or medical bills because, you know, you had to go to the doctor for your disability. Um, or, you know, like paying for services because you need certain services for your disability. So anything that's related to disability, like that you have to pay for, you can use your CalABLE account to pay for that. But you can't really use CalABLE for anything else. You can only use the money in the CalABLE account for that kind of stuff. Um, so that's sort of like the only downside. But, you know, I, you know, I think CalABLE accounts are really great because, you know, you can just put your Social Security money in there and it's never going to count against you for the resource limit. And they can hold up to $100,000. Um, so I, I think they're a really useful tool. Um, and so then the second thing that you could do if you know you sort of have too many resources one month and it's going to affect your eligibility is you can do what's called a spend down. So spend down is when you spend your excess resources on certain purchases. Um, so there's not, you can't just sort of spend your money on whatever you want. There's sort um, there are specific things that Social Security thinks is kind of like appropriate for spending down. So some examples would be like paying off existing debts. So like if you have car loans or like house loans or, you know, educational loans um, that already exist, you can use them, your money, your excess resources to pay that back. And that would Put sort it of away. Be a legitimate use of your spend down money. Um, you know, you can pay for home payments. Um, or home repairs and medical bills. So um, there's kind of like a specific list of things that you can spend down on, um, but um, that's an option for you. But the one thing about spend down is that you need to tell social security when you're doing a spend down so they know, so they can you know make sure that you're spending it on like an appropriate spend down option. Um, okay, so how much would you get, you know, if you applied for SSI and you were, you know, qualified is uh, for California? I know this says it's from 2020, but it's, I think it's still updated for 2022. I wasn't able to find any new information this year. Um, if you live in your own house, you would you can get up to $943.72 per month um, on SSI. And if you live in a group home, it's a little bit higher. Um, but, you know, they, they do look at sort of, you know, how much you're spending on food and rent and like if you have any other help, these kinds of things and like your housing situation, these are all things that can affect how much money that you're going to get, but sort of like the maximum amount that you can get if uh, you live in your own home is 900 something dollars. Excuse me. So here's just some, I guess, how to apply. I guess this is the phone number that you can use to apply. 1-800-772-1213. That's the, I believe that's the national social security line. Um, you can also apply online at this website. Um, and once you like sort of submit your initial application, what happens is that social security is going to call you to schedule an appointment. So once you know you schedule the appointment, let's, um, you're going to want to bring some things with you to make sure, you know, you have everything that you need. So one of the things that you're going to need to bring is your birth certificate. Um, you need I, to bring proof. I'm sorry for interrupting. Is there any way we can go back to the other slide you had? Yes, Thank I can Thank go you. back. Yes, sorry. Uh, I can leave it up here um, for a little bit just so you can. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm, no problem. And I can also, I'll type the link into the chat as well. Um, okay, perfect. That way, you know, people I actually don't know if you can copy paste um, from Zoom because I feel like I've had problems. Okay, actually you can, great. 
Yeah, so this is, uh, they have like an online application portal that you can apply for social security, uh, supplemental security income on. Um, you can take a screenshot of it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, you know, at the end, um, we can always go back to look at other slides. And, you know, if you have questions like, you know, my contact information slide also, we can go back to that later if you guys, at the end, if, you know, you didn't catch it. So um, just let me know. Yeah, just let me know if like something like that happens and you want to go back to the slide so I can go back so you can see it. Okay, so what do you need to bring to the initial meeting? You need to bring your birth certificate um, and sort of like proof of income and resources. So, you, you know, they're going to want to know how, like how much money do you have in your bank, like how much money do you make per month. Um, so if you can bring sort of like documentation of that stuff, that will help speed the process up. Um, you want to bring like sort of any medical records that you have that would speak to your disability and sort of how it impacts you. Um, and you're going to want to, um, if you don't have access, access to those records, you know, at that time, bring the contact information of your doctor so that Social Security can contact them to try to get that information from you. Um, so, okay, let's say you apply and they deny. They say that, okay, you, we don't think you qualify for Social Security. So then what do you do? You need to appeal um, their, you know, their, their um, evaluation of your case. Um, so the first level of appeal is reconsideration. Basically, it just has a different person look at your file and see if they think that you still don't apply. Um, you need to file the request within 60 days from the noted, from the day that you were notified that you, you know, were denied. Um, um, otherwise, if you don't appeal within 60 days, you have to start over, you have to like reapply basically. Um, if you, you know, appeal for the reconsideration and you're still denied, there's another level of appeal called um, an administrative law judge hearing where you, um, would go speak in front of a judge um, and he, you know, the judge would make a decision about whether or not they think, you know, you should qualify for social security. Um, that also has a 60 day timeline. You need to appeal within 60 days from the decision of reconsideration. Um, um, but, you know, like the appeal process, it can kind of take a long time, especially if you go to a hearing. Um, it might be, you know, I've, I've, heard of clients that, you know, they appeal for an ALJ hearing and they don't get to go to court until like almost a year later. Um, but, you know, that's sort of like the appeal process. Unfortunately, there's not really a way to make it faster um, than that. Um, so the hearing itself, if you want to go to hearing, it's an informal hearing. Um, I mean, I, I haven't done any of them since before, like before the pandemic. So I've only ever done online here or like on the phone hearings, which is a very they end up being like very informal, like, you know, the judge can't even see you. So I don't bother to put a suit on or anything like that. But, you know, it includes you and the judge um, and, you know, any person that you want to bring to help represent you. Um, and, you know, sometimes there might be a medical expert or like a jobs expert that will talk about sort of like what kind of jobs they think you can do um, in the economy. Um, but, you know, if you ever have to go to a hearing um, because, you know, they keep denying you, you can always, you know, call our office and we can see if, you know, we can help you sort of prepare for it and, you know, coach you a little bit about, you know, how to testify and things like that. Um, we only represent people who are going to the hearing in very limited circumstances for Social Security, just because there's a lot of uh, other advocacy sources out there because, you um, out there, but you know, we also have a referral list, so we can give that to you as well if we are not able to actually represent you at the hearing. Um, so let's say you know you applied and you got accepted, and now you have SSI. So, um, what are some of the things that can happen after you know you're getting SSI every month? So, um, some of the things that can happen is that they could change the amount that they're giving you. Um, sometimes they'll change the amount to zero because they don't think that you're disabled anymore. Um, they could, you know, terminate your benefits, usually because they don't think you're disabled anymore. And um, there could be what's called an overpayment where Social Security gave you money when they think that you actually didn't qualify. Um, so as Social Security is always going to send you a letter in the mail when these things happen that, that tells you what's happening. Um, if, you know, you get any of these notices and you don't agree with them, you should call our office so we can help you file an appeal or like try to get these things waived. Um, yeah, so the other thing that you need to make sure happens after you sort of are enrolled into the SSI program is that you need to report certain changes to Social Security um, within 10 days. So 
this is a list of the things that you need to report. You need to report if you move addresses or like you sort of change your living arrangement. So um, because, you know, your housing situation, well, first of all, they need to know where to send their document documents, but also because your living arrangement, like if you go from renting to owning a home, that can affect how much money you get. Um, you need to report to them if you get married. Um, you need to report to them if you get admitted into a nursing home, the hospital, or you go to prison. Um, and you need to report new wages. Actually, I think you're supposed to report wages every month to them. Um, and you need to report any like sort of increase, like new wages that you get or like new resources or, you know, like if um, a relative passed away and you inherited something, you would need to report that inheritance to Social Security. Um, and you also need to tell them when you are leaving the United States for more than a month at a time. Um, so I also want to just briefly talk about specifically what happens if you get a notice for overpayment. Overpayments happen when Social Security sends you money when they don't think you actually were qualifying for Social Security or for Supplemental Security income. So if, for instance, you were working part time when you were getting SSI and one month you made more than $1,350, like 13 if you made more than $1,350 in a month because maybe you just got like some extra tips or something, um, then the money, if they sent you benefits that month, that would be an overpayment. And you actually need to give them that money back technically. Um, so they're gonna send you like a notice that says that you owe them this amount of money. And sometimes it can be a really big number and it's really scary. Um, so, you know, if that happens to you, call our office right away so we can help you appeal. There's two things that we can do for, um, for uh, overpayment. So the first one is that um, you can appeal the overpayment, you know, that say that I actually was supposed to receive benefits that month. So it's not an overpayment. Um, and, you know, if, if you actually weren't supposed to receive benefits, you can file a waiver where you basically say, okay, yeah, I guess like you overpaid me, but it wasn't my fault you overpaid me. And also I can't pay you back because it's like substantially, like a substantial hardship for me because, you know, like I don't have $2,000 lying around to pay you back for this money that you, you guys weren't supposed to send me and you guys sent me anyway. Um, so those are the two things we can do in overpayment cases. Um, if you need help with an overpayment, just contact our office. We help people with these things all the time. Um, I see a question, very a brief question about stimulus money. I'm pretty sure stimulus money, I, I guess I don't know what you mean exactly about like what part of the stimulus money you're concerned about. For stimulus money, there is an amount of time where it doesn't count as a resource against you. Um, stimulus isn't from Social Security, so it's not like you can, it's not possible to be an overpayment as um, for uh, stimulus money can't be like something that they ask for back, I guess. Uh, but you know, you, I think it's you, I don't remember the timeline. I feel like it might be nine. You would have, I think you have nine months to spend down the stimulus money before it starts counting as a resource against, um, against you. Uh, there was a certain amount of time that they gave. Um, there are other things like tax refunds, I believe is one year before you have to spend down or, you know, like get rid of it somehow. Oh, they're saying it counted as a resource. So it would depend on sort of when you receive the stimulus money. I think that there was a time, like there's a time limit on how long you could sort of just like sit on the stimulus money. I could look it up for you specifically. And we could also talk about it. If you give our office a call, we could talk about your case um, more specifically. But uh, yeah, for generally for things like stimulus and tax refunds and things like that, there's like statutory timelines for like when you have to spend down the money before it starts counting as a resource. Um, okay, so this is my contact information. Um, our office number is 213-213-8118. My name's Stephanie Howe. Um, and my assistant, her name's Fatima. You know, if you need a, you, you need a Spanish interpretation, she speaks Spanish. So um, that is available at our office. Okay, so I'm gonna go, I know I had a question earlier. I'm gonna read it, um, but I'm just gonna open the floor for questions. So if you guys um, wanna just like uh, type your questions in the chat, just so I, I guess I, I can have a little um, order to uh, answering them, um, that would be good. So um, E said that she has a 26 year old son with Down syndrome that was receiving some SSI. And when he retired, uh, the money decreased. Uh, he received SSA money. 
Sorry, um, I'm sorry, E, I don't quite understand your question. So when you retired, his SSI benefit decreased, is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. when he retired, he, he received us uh, some uh, 400 a month from SSA, mm -hmm. and uh, they decreased the amount of SSI, okay. so that the total will become 900 something. Okay, um, I think that the reason why uh, he started receiving SSA money probably because you retired and then you started, he because you retired, I think probably what happened is he qualified for this other program called Social Security Disability Insurance, I think is what the I stands for, it's SSDI. Um, so sometimes when people retire, um, their kids can qualify for that and that gives them some money and then that money from SSA um, would then affect his SSI benefit. Um, so, and I think that that is uh, something that does happen because that, that something is that that does happen. Um, I, I guess like, I don't really know exactly the specifics. If you want to call our office um, and you know sort of send us the, the documents that Social Security sent you, we can take a look at it just to make sure everything is okay. Um, but I, what, what you're saying doesn't sound sort of like out of the realm of possibility. Okay, so every time that uh, my the SSA uh, increases, the SSI decreases, so that the total is just the same. Yes, okay, I think so. Yes, no, okay. no, that's my understanding. Yes. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. I'll I'll give you a call. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, my phone number is right there. Um, we're open nine to five Monday through Friday. Um, yes. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm, no problem. Um, okay, so for. Yeah, again, for William, your resource question, um, I would say probably that would be something more appropriate for us to talk about sort of more in detail with the specific, um, I guess, notices or like dates about when you got the stimulus, because um, there should be sort of like a grace period after you receive the stimulus before it starts counting as a resource. Um, okay, so um, Wade's asking if you have to file taxes if you only receive SSI. I actually don't know the answer to that. My uh, general generic advice is that, you know, I would always recommend people submit taxes um, if they are receiving money from somewhere. It's probably not going to be taxed if you're really only getting SSI. Um, but, you know, I think it's really better safe than sorry. I actually don't know the answer to that question. So um, I'm sorry. Uh, I could maybe look it up and then contact you later if that's something that you would like help with. Um, Yes. Um, okay. Michelle said, is this a meeting for children with Down syndrome? You have an eight-year-old and you were told at the, at the at social security office that you make too much money. So you never actually applied. Okay. Um, I, it, it's certainly possible that um, people, uh, you know, parents make too much money and they don't qualify. There is um, actually, I think a table somewhere that um, lists the amount of money that parents can make for their children. Um, I don't remember all of the details, but um, I know I was working, I worked before with a family of, you know, a, a, a one income family with two children and they made it, I think it was $6,000 a month and that actually did disqualify them from qualifying from SS, for SSI. Um, it, so it is possible that you're making too much money. Um, of course, you know, I, I don't want you to share your personal finance information right now. Um, but you know, if you if you think maybe that there's a chance that you could apply, you know, I really encourage you to call our office so we could you know maybe see if we could help you. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording. So, sorry, I'm gonna stop stop the recording. Okay.